Well, we just heard an optimistic message from Chris Stark on the climate emergency, our greatest global long-term collective challenge, but also the opportunities as well. But of course, that's not the only challenge banks and bankers face at the moment. There are wider environmental and sustainability risks and challenges. There are the challenges of leading major financial institutions during a pandemic. There are societal demands and demands from colleagues for gender and racial equality and social justice more broadly. There are changing global demographics and a rapidly shifting global geopolitical balance. There are the challenges of digital finance, open banking, new technology and new competitors. There's a continually developing regulatory agenda. There's the need to attract, retain, upskill and reskill colleagues. There's the prospect of negative interest rates and what that means strategically and operationally. And then somewhere amongst all of that, there's the day job too. And of course, we, we shouldn't forget families and friends because senior bankers do, to the surprise of many, have lives outside of work as well. There has perhaps never been a more challenging time to lead a financial institution. So I'm very grateful to our four global banking leaders for finding the time to join us this morning. So welcome to Alison Rose, Chief Executive of the NatWest Group, to Peter Blom, CEO and Chair of Triodos Bank, to Dame Susan Rice, Chair of the Banking Standards Board, and to Charles Hairsnape, Chief Executive of Gatehouse Bank. We'd love to have some questions from our global audience, so please send them in as soon as you can through the conference EFX platform, and do share your thoughts on Twitter at Finance for Change using the hashtag Ethical Finance 2020. First of all, though, um, I'd just like to uh, check in with you all and, uh, and begin by asking you, firstly, how are you, where are you, and how have the past seven months been for you personally and professionally? Perhaps, perhaps Alison. Um, well, thank you. I'm very well. Um, nice to see uh, you all. Uh, I mean, it's certainly been a challenging period that we've all been facing. I, I, I think probably most people would say it's been some of the most personally and professionally challenging times that we've ever faced because they're so uncertain and we're dealing not just with a health crisis, it's a health crisis that's triggered an economic crisis and, and there's a huge amount of uncertainty. But, you know, on the professional level, um, we've, if you'd asked me uh, a few weeks before the pandemic, if I could get 50,000 colleagues working from home, I, I would have been a little bit sceptical, but we have and, and that's good. I'm currently working at home at the moment, but have some time in the office as well. Um, on the personal level, you know, uh, I have two children, so managing homeschooling as well as running a bank has been uh, definitely a challenge. But, but on the positive side, I've, I've got to see my children every night for supper, which is an unusual thing um, and not something I've, ex I've experienced. So like most people, there have been uh, huge challenges, but good and bad bits. And, and we're all having to adapt very quickly to a new environment. Oh, great, Jess. And so which, which role is more challenging? Uh, a bank chief executive or being a teacher, do you think? Oh, gosh, uh, being a teacher. Uh, <laughs> <definitely>. <laughs> Great. Uh, Charles, so, so Charles isn't joining us from, from home today. Charles, how, how are you? And perhaps you'd like to tell us where you are today. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I, I do spend most of my time at home, but today I'm in Wilmslow in Cheshire, if anybody knows where that is. Uh, we have one of our small offices is, uh, is based there. Uh, it's actually nice weather today, which is extremely rare for the Greater Manchester Cheshire area. Uh, but yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, uh, as Alison has said, it's been it's been an incredible time for lots of different reasons. Uh, we're a much much smaller bank than that West Group, but we managed to get all our people at home straight away when the pandemic first started. Um, on a personal level, um, I've got because I'm ancient, I've got older children uh, who have left home. Uh, one of whom is a surgeon and had caught COVID in the hospital. So I've had first-hand experience of a family that she, you know, had a mild symptoms. Thank goodness, recovered well. So I've had first-hand knowledge of you know the kind of personal uh, worries of the whole COVID thing, mm. as I'm sure obviously many millions of people had as well. So. Yep, yeah, it's, uh, it's good that we've actually got uh, up and running as a bank as well. And um, we continue to perform, you know, very efficiently, trying to keep uh, good mm -hmm. customer service going, which is always the primary objective, really. So, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm delighted to hear your, your son's uh, safe and well as, as well. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. important. Uh, Susan, how, how have you been? 
Well, I've been fine. I was thinking as, as my colleagues were just talking, if I had to put a couple of words to the last six months, what would they be? And they would be time and discovery. Um, so let me explain um, what I mean. I chair or I'm the senior independent director on several corporate boards in three sectors, all of them with essential workers. So groceries, water, and of course, financial services. Um, and what I found across the piece is a huge increase in the meetings we've had, in the time being spent to make sure contingency plans were worked out, to focus on um, how our staff were doing, were they equipped, were they coping, you know, was there kitchen table? Did it have four legs? Were there children crawling on the floor to get to the fridge to stay out of the camera view? All sorts of things. Um, and all of these take time, lots of time around year ends. So again, more meetings, more decisions uh, being made right across the piece. Um, so there is a sense that time has not only been taken up more, but actually has been different. Normal life, I go out, different cities, different places for my meetings, in between meetings, I go outside, I go upstairs, I walk, take a train, a plane. Um, there, are, there are sort of interruptions in the day and the days seem not only full but long. Now they're full, but there are no interruptions. I sit and I look at <laughs> Zoom or whatever other app I have in front of me. And after the first month, I realized I hadn't really gone outside except to walk the dog at night and um, hadn't had any exercise and actually had to sort of rethink how I was spending my time. That's the time bit. The discovery is maybe a more personal comment, well, partly professional, partly discovering um, how to use at least seven different um, platforms for having uh, virtual meetings. I've got them all here. They all work, some better than others. This is the best. So, uh, so um, there's a lot of discovery in how to make this work. I've discovered that I don't like talking on the telephone to one person anymore unless I can see them. Um, that I've just completely changed my expectations. Um, but chairing a board meeting um, uh, on Zoom or whatever the, and the platform is, is really hard. You have to be so disciplined. Um, make sure you've got everybody and you really do miss the informal interaction. But the other area of discovery is that I have three children. They're all grown. Two had weddings planned in the first half of 2020. My son in Shanghai was to get married at the end of March to his Russian fiance. Um, they couldn't, but because they're both foreign, they had to go to Hong Kong just before the Chinese New Year to get a legal marriage because you can't marry if you're foreign nationals in China. They did that, took a three day mini moon, which is a tiny honeymoon. And during those three days, Shanghai closed down with the pandemic. And so their places of work told them to go home. He came to us in Scotland. She went home to Irkutsk in Russia. Um, and he eventually got a visa four weeks later, joined her. They got back to Shanghai after seven weeks. What a way to start a marriage. But if you talk to them and look at them, the smiles don't leave their faces. And um, you, know, you discover there's a lot of ways to do things. Discovered it even more with my daughter, due to get married near us in Scotland in um, early July. They decamped to our house because uh, two of them doing Zoom calls on their kitchen table at the same time didn't work down in Oxford. In, in Oxford. Um, so they were here and my oldest son from Edinburgh had come out here. So we became a family again um, of grown-ups. And she suddenly said she wanted to take um, things in her own hands, in control. And in two weeks, we organized a Zoom wedding. Um, and I won't go into the details, but completely COVID rule compliant in Scotland, eight people, including bride and groom, outside a local florist who built an amazing floral arch and almost cried when she was asked to do this. It had no weddings, which is her trade for four months. Uh, the rain stopped after 10 days. It stopped an hour and a half before the ceremony. We put down our see-through umbrellas. Um, and we had 100 people joining this Zoom wedding from four continents in every time zone. And I sat there thinking, wedding doesn't have to be a huge party with lots of people and lots of stress and worry. Um, this is really what a wedding should be. So you learn to open your mind and just discover things can be different and very good. Mm, well, fantastic. And uh, of course, that's partly what we're hoping to achieve today is to sort of open uh, 
the minds of a, a large global and growing ethical finance community and discover what can be good from this. Um, Peter, does a lot of that uh, resonate uh, with your experience of the last uh, seven months as well? <laughs> it had in a certain way also be a journey, I must say. It started for us when we heard from our Spanish colleagues who were really ahead of us with Corona, what they had to do. Mm -hmm. So the first signals were, were there and then we had to uh, close the office basically or at least uh, have people working from home that were very well I think regulators were very much impressed by how good banks have become in oper to be operational from that. They themselves were not so good at it, by the way. They admitted <laughs> yes. it. They could, learn, they could learn from us. Uh, very quickly, uh, we moved our attention to the customers. We really wanted to know where our customers were and uh, had very, very close contact with them. Some of them, we call them almost every week. Uh, and all the, the, the teams that did very well there. That was very important. We also helped a lot the government by finding the right sort of fine tuning in the measures they could take. Uh, we, we created a small Corona credit facility. Other countries did as well, but we really helped there to find out what was the best way to do that uh, with full guarantee or partly guarantee, all those things. And the last thing we started to do was really thinking about what does this all tell us about our current economic system? I think the resilience of the system is not good. And actually we discovered with our economists, I'm also part of the sustainable finance lab in the Netherlands, that the whole resilience factor is not properly in business models. Right? We have to learn there. We have to learn that the longer term resilience is a price and do we really price them in? So it's an ex externality we have to look into. So I'm very interested to see if we can keep that thinking on that level and start to change our economy, including the way we finance the economy. So for me, quite an interesting learning journey, partly working from home now, or also partly from the office. Great journey in that sense. Mm. Great. Well, I think, thanks for introducing some themes. I think we're going to pick up on uh, later on as well. Um, but most importantly, it's kind of great to hear that everyone and uh, you and your families are all all safe and well, which is the most important thing. Um, but let's turning to some of the uh, areas for discussion today. So, Alison, if I can come to you, you first, perhaps. So, I think just before all this started seven months ago, is that you, you set out a new strategy as the new CEO for a bank with a, a different name at that point. Um, and uh, you set out your stall uh, for, for Rename NatWest to be a purpose led bank. I mean, can you tell us a bit more about what that means? And, and in particular, has purpose, or at least perhaps some of the focus, changed now because of the pandemic? Uh, thank you. No, well, we announced our new strategy on the 14th of February, and it was very much launching the new purpose strategy of the bank. And for me, that's about um, building a strategy which is thinking about all of our stakeholders and, and balancing the sort of returns that you need to make for everyone rather than just on one dimension. And for me, it's about making sure we have a sustainable business model, um, supporting customers, communities and shareholders and balancing those needs. At the heart of it, it, for me, it was about wanting to build much tighter and stronger relationships with our customers at every stage of their lives. So less transactional, but more, more long term. And I think a key part of that as well was thinking about the areas that we as a bank could have the most impact and the most influence to, to build real value, not just for our customers, but also our communities of which climate is one of the key focus areas that, that I picked up on, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the, the, the COVID pandemic hasn't changed that strategy at all. In fact, in some ways, it's been an enormous test of embedding that. And we've almost had a, a real acceleration of some of the choices we need to make to be purpose-led, making sure we're there to support our customers, to support communities, to build long-term relationships. And that means, you know, you work with them through both the good and the bad times rather than being very transactional. I picked when I launched the strategy three areas of focus where I think as a bank and a financial institution, we can have the biggest impact on our customers' lives. Um, we focused on financial inclusion. It's an area where helping people with their money, helping create inclusivity in education around people's financing 
it was a key area that becomes even more important as people rebuild their finances and rebuild their balance sheets through this period of quite extraordinary disruption enterprise which is small supporting business we're the largest lender at NatWest group for small businesses um, and for businesses across the uk and remove Removing barriers that get in the way for entrepreneurs to start up and scale up their businesses was something I think we can make a real difference. And then climate, because it's, as your speakers have already said earlier, it's one of the biggest challenges of our generation. And as a leading bank, we feel we have a very important role to finance the transition and help our customers transition to a low carbon economy and I think it's going to take immense collaboration across regulators, financial institutions, trade bodies and all aspects for us to address this issue which is a burning issue. So we set a very bold ambition, we said that we would aim to be climate positive by 2025 for our own operations but also that we would halve the um, climate impact of our financing activity by the end of this decade with an intent to align it to the Paris Agreement. Now that means that we have to understand the exposures on our balance sheet, it means we have to work with our clients and customers to transition and we made some very clear statements about how we would do that. I think all of that becomes an even more important North Star and imperative during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, thank you, Alison. Um, Peter, if I could kind of come to you, um, uh, because Triodos, I think, has been a purpose-led bank, kind of focused on impact since it was founded. I think probably about forty years ago now. And you know, now that policymakers, regulators, and you know, at least in the UK and Europe, some of the major institutions like uh, NatWest and uh, under Alison's leadership are, are catching up with you, if I can put it that way. Certainly, in terms of the climate agenda. Are your priorities changing at all? And uh, you know, how can you continue to differentiate Triodos? Well, it was since the beginning, and I was there in 1980 when we started, it's just coming from college and starting with four other people, a small bank. Well, this has been quite a journey in itself. Um, I think this was always our dream that we could show the other banks that it can be done. And I see it finally starting to happen. I mean, I have some issues to discuss with my colleagues, but I think in general, I'm very impressed what the other banks have been doing in the last years. And I really feel it's going in the right direction. So the, the sort of situation of a front runner is always that they want to be followed. So in that sense, I should not complain now that we get competitors. That's actually um, is, is, an, is a sort of success we have now. Um, and the, the topic is so big that there was, it's impossible to do it by one bank. So I'm very happy that the financial sector comes in and takes its responsibility. But we have to realize not so long ago, it was something banks were not so interested in. And I think uh, the SDGs, the climate conference in Paris, they really put those things on the agenda. And, and we have been starting in different countries. I'm not sure if that's also the case in the UK, by the way to bring the whole financial sector together in agreements, collective agreements, to the uh, reduction of 50% CO2 in 2030. And really get commitment from the sector, say we want to see in our uh, balance sheet, and Alison was referring to that as well, I'm very happy about it. We want to see in our balance sheet that it goes really with a concrete reduction of 50%. Uh, I think that's a very important achievement and can only be happy about. And then about differentiating, I think for us as a front runner, niche player, uh, we have an entirely sustainable portfolio. I think we continue to see new opportunities where we can, for example, do it in a, in a social inclusive way, the finance, uh, mm -hmm. creating a lots of small projects who can be, an, again, a role example for others. I think also the connection we can make between equity and, and debt and to bring that together through our investment funds is still rather new. So I don't think there is a lack of work to be done and we can uh, really show new territories we can go into. We also will watch very carefully that there is no greenwashing. And uh, maybe we come later back on that because I think uh, banks have to be honest. There is still a lot of brown assets in their portfolios and actually to get uh, to transform those 
brown assets into green assets is one of the main tasks, I think, particularly of the big banks. And they have time for that. Actually, from an environmental point, not so much time, but they need the time to make that uh, transformation happen. And I think there we have to watch very carefully that we don't stay too much behind with that. And we are very happy to be uh, the, the signaling factor in the financial sector, because I think that's important. We have to really move more quickly now. And it's not something we can take a lot of time for. It has to go much more quickly than so far. So that's a real challenge for us as well to help our colleagues to be aware of that and together make it work. Great, thanks. Thanks, Peter. And, and I would like to come back to some of the points on social inclusion and perhaps as a broader point there around social justice as well uh, later on. But um, picking up on your point around differentiation as well, perhaps Charles, I could bring you in now. Um, and perhaps not everyone joining us from around the world will know that Gatehouse Bank is a Sharia compliant UK bank, although I know we have a lot of finance professionals joining us from uh, Southeast Asia, and many of those may be Islamic finance professionals themselves. But could you perhaps tell us a little more ab ab about um, uh, your approach and, and what this means in terms of the, the green finance, the responsible banking agenda, and perhaps what, and what if anything, has it meant in particular in recent months too? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I mean, uh, yeah, probably not a lot of people to do with us. Uh, Gatehouse Bank is a UK registered full bank, but it is a Sharia compliant bank and it has been throughout its whole life of 10 years. Um, essentially, that equates to ethical finance, because if you look at the principles of Sharia finance, it's about fairness. It's about inclusion. It's about work looking after your colleagues, your consumers and also your community in particular. So we're really, we're, we're proud that that is our history. And actually it chimes very well with a lot of the ethical finance debates that are currently going on. Um, we were also a founder signatory of the UN Principles for Responsible Banking. Very proud to do that. But we're very small. We're a very small bank in the scheme of things. Um, and we have a kind of relatively diverse range of activities between financing home finance in a Sharia compliant way. But also we, we develop and look after several funds that build in conjunction with UK house builders homes for rent in the UK. So we have, a, we have a lot of kind of footprint around the real estate, but particularly residential real estate. Uh, and that interests us hugely because we think we can make a massive difference in our own small way. Um, I mean, an example would be, you know, of the 1,600 houses that we currently have built and managed entirely in the north of England as it happens, and they're rented out, um, but they're all built on brownfield sites. So none of them are built in urban sprawl, green belt or any greenfield sites. Mm -hmm. But the residential home sector is 33%, I believe, of all the emissions in the UK. Mm. So tackling that is really a massive part of, uh, of, of tackling the whole, you know, climate change agenda. So because we're small, you know, we can do lots of things and we can do lots of initiatives, but we need to be feel that we're partnered by some of the big banks because we need to have joined up initiatives and a collective approach to, to this. So I, I think rather than relying on regulators and trade bodies and all those kind of things, there's a fantastic opportunity for big banks and small banks to talk a bit more and find out what she, each other are doing. It, it clearly can't be a competitive thing because some of these banks are huge and we're really quite tiny. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a competitive thing at all. It's about how can we learn from people who've got great resources doing huge amounts of research that we can kind of, you know, piggyback on and, and have some consistency. So I'm looking forward to this whole initiative being around, as people have said before, collaboration. I think that's the most important thing that we can do in the UK. What we don't want clearly is the regulator <clears throat> or anybody else coming along and telling us how to do it and, and chiving us up. That would be absolutely the wrong approach. So I think we could, we've done some great things as individual banks and finance institutions over the last two to three years. Long way to go, obviously. But I think, you know, if we can do more together, that will be, you know, that'd be fantastic. Um, so there's a lot more I can talk about later on in terms of what we're doing in practice. Um, but we, we think we're on a really strong journey now and uh, we'll carry that on, whether it be our own footprint, which we're looking at in the UK. We have, we have you know, a lot less offices than that West do, but we do have offices. Uh, and we're looking to make those obviously carbon neutral. That's, that seems like a quick winning, quick win and working closely with the Carbon Trust to make sure that we're independently audited rather than just saying that we've done it. Um, and then moving forward from there to see if we can get our, our home financing in particular more 
carbon neutral as time goes on. So I hope that gives Great, a flavour of kind of who we are and what we do. It definitely, no, I think that's that's really helpful. Thank, thank, thank you, Charles. Um, and then maybe Susan, if, if if I could come to you, and uh, perhaps later we'll we'll talk about the many different hats you bring to this and many other discussions. But just for the moment, with your kind of banking standards board hat on and thinking about which which again is a is a is a body that does try and uh, uh, help banks collaborate, particularly on issues of culture within financial institutions. Um, I know that the, the Banking Standards Board reiterates Mark Carney's point that a, a clear purpose is a re prerequisite for a strong culture. So, so how, how, how does the Banking Standards Board help banks understand the idea of culture and how to successfully embed it? And, and how does this all then link with the idea of, of working together on the climate emergency and building back to get better uh, post COVID-19? Big question, I know. A huge question, Simon. <laughs> so cut me off when uh, when you need to. Um, let me just start with the, what you ended with about banks working together. Um, one of the things that um, the initiatives that are carried out by the Banking Standards Board um, do is to create uh, something common that banks, large and small, and building societies, and increasingly now we're working with investment management and insurance, so really a lot of different types of firms across the financial services sector, but I'll focus in and use the banks as the short-term uh, word here. It, um, it provides something in common for banks um, where they have the ability to interrogate, if you will, uh, what happens within their own organizations, not, not what the leaders are saying at the top about the values and the goals, but actually how the staff in each organization uh, operate, how they make decisions, how they um, deal with customers, how they use judgment, something that it's very hard for people at the top really to see. And that's where the Banking Standards Board, the BSB work uh, comes into play. Uh, and in my experience, both here and in at least one other country that asked me to go a couple of years ago and talk to them about this, one often finds some banks um, which say, well, you know, we're big and we're good at these good things in society, so we don't need to be part of anything else. Actually, having banks come together to be part of a collective uh, opportunity that um, the BSB work gives them means that they can see how they're doing. They can see others that are doing better than themselves unnamed, but they will be part of cohorts. Uh, and um, it begins to move them on. So that co collective working together really is important, even in that world of culture uh, and, um, and how organizations operate. Uh, I think current time, two real areas of focus. One is on the employee. Uh, you know, um, I think a colleague said recently, the employees come to the top of the stakeholder wheel during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, we are providing support, as I said earlier, uh, and thinking a lot about our staff, but we also need to think about the vision for work in the future and what will work for them because things will be different. I think everyone agrees about that. So we need to think about supporting our staff today, making sure that they have what they need and they're doing what they can and feeling valued, but also how will this work for tomorrow? The other big thing right now that I think is challenging during the pandemic is around the whole ESG um, initiative and focus, which had been rising up. And many of the institutions and in, 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 in Nat West and Allison are absolute um, examples of this, realize that the recovery from what's happening right now uh, won't be a real recovery unless it's done against that uh, view of long-term uh, value uh, that comes from elements in the ESG agenda. So all of these things are about the what, but then you come to the how, uh, and the how is really where the BSB work begins to, uh, to, to cut in. Um, we um, um, with member banks and building society here through our survey and, and, and our assessment, which is in train right now, to look at how the pandemic has effect, affected culture and behavior in their organizations, and in particular how leaders in the industry have been perceived as handling the crisis. 
Uh, we've asked questions around the effect of distributed and hybrid working, support for mental health and well-being, ongoing importance of diversity and inclusion. And goodness, we, we all often refer to diversity and inclusion and focus in on diversity, but inclusion, when you take that broadly across demographics, across income levels, across geographies, is a real challenge as we look forward. And with a, a climate hat on, um, it's a real challenge to make sure we uh, cover those chasms, we don't create more of them. The, the BSB is um, really helping firms build up a picture of how the pandemic has affected their people and organizations both positively and negatively. Um, and, and organizations need that knowledge as they reshape their workplaces going forward. Uh, and we've also brought together uh, a number of leaders. So a couple of weeks ago, I hosted a discussion with um, oh, about three dozen chairs, non-executive directors across financial services. And we talked about the challenges uh, and the uh, amount of sharing there, again, and collaboration and, and understanding others has been very, um, mm -hmm. very helpful. So I can talk more about specific BSB work, but the point is that I think there's never been such a focus and such a need to focus on the culture within an organization, not what you say you want it to be, but what is actually happening so you can then address it. Okay. Um, and I wonder perhaps, Alison, if I could bring you in to, to comment on that, um, particularly on the, the social inclusion or the inclusion and diversity point, because um, you've been very outspoken, I think, well, outspoken certainly for a bank chief executive, um, particularly on the Black Lives uh, Matters area. Um, I mean, what does that mean on a daily basis for you and your colleagues at, at, at NatWest? Um, you know, how, how can you put that sort of equality, uh, diversity and inclusion agenda into practice? Um, and you might want to think not just about the, the BLM side of things, but uh, many colleagues uh, joining us from around the world may not, for instance, know that uh, you've done a great deal of work on female entrepreneurship and female leadership as well, uh, to promote those in the UK too. Sure. Well, look, I, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think the, the inclusivity element of the debate is absolutely fundamental to having the right culture and the right organization to, to create the right success. And it's a, it's a huge part of but something that's a personal passion for me, but also I think to have a healthy, thriving organization, you need to have a truly in inclusive culture. Um, what, one area that I focused on in particular has been around uh, female entrepreneurs that, that you just touched on there, which is something that I led a piece of research across the UK and globally into the barriers facing female entrepreneurs, the fact that there aren't as many women starting businesses, but actually some incredibly shocking facts that their ability to get access to the same level of financing, the same level of scale up capital as male led businesses was very restricted. And if you looked at the level of potential that we were leaving on the table, the lack of support that we were putting in place for female entrepreneurs in the UK, if we could get them to the same level of access of financing, access of capital, you were talking about a potential of a 250 billion gap to the economy. So in a time when you're thinking about business success, product activity, entrepreneurship, which is really the lifeblood of a thriving economy, the fact that you don't have true inclusivity or, or the same level of access to financing is a pretty shocking um, statistic. And, and to bring that to life, what we identified that was only 1% of venture capital financing was going to female-led businesses. So it's something that I feel very passionately about. So we put a lot of support in place there to sort of really focus on how do you remove the barriers that are getting in the way of these amazing entrepreneurs having the same opportunity and success. Um, we made some great initiatives and, and the demand is there. And I think that's the really important thing when you're talking about creating inclusivity. You're just removing the barriers. You're opening up the same opportunity. We now have 66 financial institutions who signed up to a code that really supports helping 
access funding for women. We have a, um, a venture capital fund that is really trying to make sure that as much VC funding goes to female-led businesses. And at NatWest, we launched a billion pound fund um, earlier this year. Uh, we launched it in February, actually, to say, how can, we, how can we signpost and make it clear that female entrepreneurs can get bank funding and get the financing? It's one aspect of the overall financing route. Um, and just to give you a sense of the underlying demand that's there, we've seen since then a 630% increase in the funding requests for female entrepreneurs and over half of that fund has already been committed and drawn down by entrepreneurs. So inclusivity for me is about remove the barriers, you know, get get those who can help remove, remove the barriers and put the right support metrics in place. On the, on the Black Lives Matter debate, um, which I think was a very shocking wake up call for everyone. It's a really about what is the lived experience of all your colleagues at, at NatWest. We've had BAME targets for a while in our organization, but until everybody's experience is for a progressive and inclusive culture, then you don't have a progressive and inclusive culture. So I think it's incumbent on everyone, not just our black colleagues to speak up, but everyone in the organization to speak up and have the uncomfortable conversations that are absolutely necessary and look at how we can create a culture that's truly inclusive. And at a basic level, it's not because this is the right thing to do, truly inclusive and diverse organizations are incredibly successful because you break diversity of thought, you bring the right talent through the organization, and then your organization will reflect the communities and customers you work with and for. So it's a topic that I feel quite passionately about, but I think it's one where organizations have to do more than just talk about them. They have to put practical steps in place to really confront the issues that are there right the way through the organization. And a bit like the climate debate, it's a non-competitive sport. And um, it's something that if, if particularly for me, if I can help all organizations embrace the things that have worked for us around helping female entrepreneurs, then everybody benefits from that. And the same across the whole Black Lives Matter debates as well. It's great to hear that the 66 institutions are, are signed up uh, already um, on the uh, entrepreneurship side, um, because that's another great example of collaboration. Charles, I noticed you were you were kind of nodding uh, a, a lot uh, during that, um, especially uh, when Alison was 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 talking around uh, Black Lives Matters and bringing the lived experience to to work. I mean, again, based where you are in the UK and the markets you serve, is this something that's of kind of daily resonance to, to yourself and your colleagues? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's something we're all passionate about in in the organisation I work for. I think I think the key thing, especially in a small organisation, is just making sure we implement and do things. Um, you know, some definitely not NatWest, but other organisations do talk about things, and you think, well, where's the actual proof of it? Um, so, in our own little way, you know, we're doing the basic things that I think people would expect us to do, and that is, you know, how does your appraisal system work? Does it reflect how managers manage their people in a, in a very diverse and responsible way so those those just very basic but essential things we survey our staff on a frequent basis for diversion and inclusive inclusive questions um we have i mean we're nowhere near where we need to be but as a small business we have uh, in total 45 percent of our workforce are female but we don't have enough it's a classic we don't have enough uh, female people in senior positions we have some but nowhere near mm. enough so we're kind of very keen to uh, tackle that inequality um, because i think you know getting that broader perspective on challenges and solutions make will make us a better bank and and that's proven i think where that does happen so we're really keen to embed those key things it, it's part of our culture in in a way but we need to implement more and more and as i said before the collaboration is really important we do see institutions that seem to be making great strides and great progress we must be able to learn some things from these people um, and in our own little way we can probably share one or two things you know we we do have we, we do have the odd good idea so we'd like to share those wherever possible um, but I think you know I think looking at diversion and inclusivity um, you know we we have surveyed our staff recently again uh, and there are areas we, we believe we can sharpen up but all these things as Alison has, has, has well alluded to are all connected so I think you know there's a great institution which is the the women in ethical uh, finance um organization which we are signatory to as well and they're doing a great job relatively underfunded uh, lots more could be done in that area 
Um, so we're, we're keen not just to support where we can the, the women in finance, which is a fantastic, and it has been for quite a while, fantastic um, initiative, and done extremely well, but also in the smaller, you know, ethical finance businesses, the overseas banks in the UK, there's a lot more I think we can do there. And we, you know, we like to hope to, to play an increasing part in that. Great. Thanks, Charles. Well, let, let me come back to, to Peter now. Let's bring us back to... Um, uh, to climate um, and I'm going to bring in some questions from the audience here as well. Um, so, so Peter, I mean, we, we kind of established earlier, you know, Triodos was very much one of the first movers in the, the climate and environmental green finance space. But, but what are your views sort of personally and institutionally on the, the wider environmental and sustainability risks beyond climate, for, for example, biodiversity loss? And in fact, we've had a question from um, Malika and, uh, and from Janice uh, on this. In fact, Janice asked in particular, you know, should finance avoid animal agriculture as this is the second largest source of emission? Um, but I know last week we, we talked a lot about the biodiversity side in particular, which is very much where we're now now moving to from a pure focus on climate. Um, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that, please. Just to make sure that we are not seen as only a climate bank, we I'm very uh, uh, impressed by the, 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 the issues around social issues. We have been very much involved with women's world banking in the 90s, early 90s already, to really help people, women mainly in development countries, to have access to finance. What was then real not heard of. It was really seen as a big mm -hmm. risk by the banks, and now it really has changed, and now also has come to this part of the world. So that's a very good development. I really like what I hear. On the biodiversity, I think even more complicated than uh, measuring CO2 emissions in your balance sheet is measuring biodiversity in your balance sheet. I think that's, an, but maybe biodiversity is, an, is even more key to the future of the planet and the future for people to live and to have a healthy agriculture and so forth and so on. So we should really include biodiversity in our goals as financial institutions and as the economy. And I think particularly agriculture is really a threat to biodiversity at the moment. Let's just call it that way. And I know it's not to blame the farmers because the farmers are in many ways framed in a system where they can only do one thing. And there I think the banks can come in uh, because they're connected to all parts of the chain and say, well, this sort of farming we have today really has to change. Now, I'm very impressed by in that sense, what has been done in the, in the European Committee um, from farm to fork is an important big part of the Green Deal. And uh, it really will uh, strive for organic farming 25% uh, in 2030. So that's quite an achievement if we can do that. But also in general, get the whole food question and the farming question included, including biodiversity more on the table. So I feel, uh, and we just signed a pledge on on on, uh, on biodiversity. I don't. I think HSBC did as well, by the way, uh, as the other English-based uh, bank, British-based bank. But I think also like CO2, banks should really include in their assessments of new loans how does it work out for the biodiversity question. And therefore, I think we get a more integrated environmental approach, and not just on CO2. CO2 is very important from a certain perspective, but it cannot only be that. Great, thank you. Um, would anyone like to come sort of add to add to Peter's point on, on biodiversity and some of the, the broader sustainability risks, or should we move on to a different subject? Okay, because I'm, I'm We've had a couple of questions in from the audience as well. Again, change, changing the subject um, on the subject of, of technology. Um, so thanks to Elisa from Judo Bank in Australia and, and others. Um, so sort of summarizing the, the questions, I guess we often hear that technology is the solution, whether it's to climate change, to improving customer outcomes, um, uh, to, to everything. But is it? And, and, and you know, would banking be better if built on algorithms and AI rather than on human judgment? And, and what are the main ethical challenges when using AI, if we can summarize those in a, in a, in a minute or two? So, Susan, maybe I could come to you first on that. 
Uh, yes. Um, so a couple of, of overarching responses. One is we're not going to stop the um, forward movement of technology and AI and mm -hmm. robotics and decisions and um, algorithms and so forth. But what we can do is control and shape them. And kind of like my daughter with her Zoom wedding say, we will take control. Uh, and I think that's a really important point. Um, I, I go back to one of the early prompts to the financial crisis at the you know, earlier part of this century, um, which had to do with a lot of uh, algorithms being created by a very major US bank at the time. And people started deferring to the answers uh, and not questioning the answers. Um, and, and there it, it depends how you use the technology, uh, not just what you use it for, but how you use it. I think judgment ultimately is really important. Um, and so there has to be good thought right through the piece as these things are developed, um, the approaches, the technologies, as to how they'll be used and how in your own organization in a bank, you intend to make use of them. Um, and, and this is where, um, it, it, and I guess that really matters to my mind because it is far too easy, and I've seen this, I'm gonna run a bank, um, it, it, it's too easy for people to say, the committee decides, the computer tells us that's the answer. They back away. They don't make judgments, and that is a you know a hugely negative thing in the world of banking. Banks are in a tremendously privileged position because they're a transmission vehicle between uh, policies of government and desires of, uh, of of regulators and funds from this party that go to that party. Uh, banks are in a really important position and they cannot simply relegate or delegate those decisions in their work to uh, automation. But automation has a hugely important place uh, in terms of um, uh, giving greater information, help, information helping understanding um, in terms of giving access to uh, customers. I mean, I think back, so I have one of my other hats is in the green agenda world. Um, when I was working at Lloyd's, uh, large companies can um, work out how to borrow money for their green projects or uh, how to talk to their bankers. Small businesses, the SME community finds it so much harder. And Lloyd's not only trained a lot of its um, relationship managers for that a particular group of businesses, the SME community, but it then basically took the requirements, which were at that point rather clumsy, the forms that had to be filled out, uh, and they basically created a, an application in a box, and that worked for the smaller business, and it became um, a digital, digitally enabled um, activity. So it, 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 digital um, activities, hugely important, but as bankers, we cannot lose control of what they're used for, how we want them to be used, and what we want to achieve with them. They don't yet have the human brain to know what is best for humans. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, one of the things that connects all four of you on the, the panel is that you're all career bankers. Um, I won't embarrass anybody by saying how long I think you may have been, been bankers for, but you've all you know, seen how banking's emerged and how technology's become ever more involved, particularly in credit decisions and, and so on over over the years. Um, you know, Peter, what are, what, are, what are your thoughts? I think I'm right in saying you started off as a, was it a loan officer, um, sort of uh, um, perhaps 10 years ago or something, something like that. Um, so to, to, what's the balance do you believe between sort of technology and judgment? I think uh, as long as you can uh, see technology as a helpful instrument, uh, then I think it works well. If you if technology starts to lead your judgment and you are more sort of the facilitator of the technology, then it becomes more complicated. I think even in the most uh, advanced uh, automated lending programs, particularly for SMEs. I think there's always a moment uh, where the uh, business banker has to come up with his personal judgment on this, on, so, on the character of the entrepreneur almost. Like, well, do I really believe that person mm -hmm. if I look them in the eyes or not? And if we start to leave out that part and 
uh, replace it by uh, artificial intelligence, I think you may come a long way, but in the end, I'm not sure if we get a lot of new things coming. I mean, the artificial intelligence tend always to repeat what already has been successful. So mm -hmm. is there really enough out of the box possibilities and uh, new possibilities you haven't seen really before? So I'm very much uh, impressed by our loan officers, how much they can see in an entrepreneur where I feel mm -hmm. sometimes, well, from some of the data, you shouldn't do it. But if I hear you talking about it, I believe it. And that element in banking, I always have been seeing that as quite important and is also part of the success of a bank. Now, having said uh, I think that, Peter, I think you may, you may. Uh, just to finish off, uh, having said that, yeah. I think some of the more commodity products like mortgages, I can imagine we go much further than today. But the relationship banking in its pure form in business banking, I really hesitate to rely completely on uh, uh, IA. Hmm. So actually, what I wanted to ask was, was is judgment then a greater defense against greenwashing uh, than, auto than automation? Uh, picking up the points we made earlier. Um, do you want to come back I on that quickly, Peter? Well, I think greenwashing had a lot to do with being transparent and being much more communicative about what you do. I think you have to show uh, and to prove what you have done, not just come up with some nice intentions. And we have been trying that, and that's relatively more easy for a smaller bank than a big bank to show all our uh, lending on our website in categories and in numbers, and therefore creating a lot of proof for our customers who invested in us and who has deposited with us that we actually doing what we are telling people to do as a principle. So I think the, the greenwashing can be avoided by more communication being very transparent. And then I think it can also be a way of getting trust in banks from the public again, uh, because that is on a very low level at the moment. And this can be part of the agenda of the whole sector to be much more accountable and transparent about what what you're doing related to purpose and principles it is not just being transparent it's not enough you have to have a purpose and i think we are moving that way we are moving that way mm -hmm. great thank you okay so um i'm going to use the last couple of minutes we've got if i may to ask everybody uh, a quick question from from our audience i'm looking at the audience questions as they come in there have been a lot of them um so if each i ask each of you a, a different question and if you could just try and keep answers fairly succinct please um so alison first of all how do we make ethical finance accessible to people who aren't high net worth and middle class um, well, I think you, you have to recognise that you're supporting across a huge uh, waterfront of customers and make everything as accessible as you possibly can. I think Peter made some good points there around transparency, um, making sure that you're putting the tools in the hands of your customers so that you can um, see what's happening happening and, and measure and be very transparent. This is this is a really important period of transition, not just in terms of inclusivity, but also climate, that we don't leave anyone behind. So I think transparency is really important, making sure we're financing the transition, making sure we're creative, truly inclusive cultures um, in order to make sure that everybody benefits here. Great, thank you. Changing the subject completely. Charles, you, you mentioned regulators earlier, so I'm going to direct this one uh, towards towards you. I mean, I know you were saying earlier you wanted regulators to, to perhaps step back um, a bit. Um, but what do you think about the idea of adjusting capital weightings? You know, should we look at a green supporting factor or a brown penalty factor for banks, given that um, if we do so something to shift capital weightings, that's more likely to change banks' behaviour than anything else? Yeah, I mean, I was saying I wasn't saying regulators should step back. I was saying we should step forward and uh, not have the regulator <laughs> try and encourage us what to do. Um, but no, I think I think capital does play a fundamentally important part in this, and particularly at the smaller end of the banking spectrum, where capital is probably one could argue a bit scarcer on, on occasions. You know, being being more, um, I suppose, beneficial to the economy and the world and, and people's well-being should have some form of a, of a benefit to it. 
that therefore you can expand further in those well thought through initiatives. Um, I think so. I think I think there is definitely some merit in conversations along those lines. I think the whole question of capital allocation, big banks, small banks, you know, IRB, non-IRB, though all those kind of debates, I think there's an opportunity to to revise them actually and have an open conversation about it. So I think that would be a very positive than how big it could be. But I think those kind of conversations are definitely worth having. And I think actually would steer some banks into, you know, be a little bit more kind of aggressive on those beneficial areas and just just tease them more into that activity or speed up the journey i suppose really so i'd be very much in favor of conversations along those lines hmm. well um susan and peter i'm afraid time has time has beaten us i'm afraid but i can i can let you off the let you off the hook and i'll i'll send you the difficult questions the audience has sent in for you later so you can see what uh, see what you missed um, I wish we could continue for, for, for a lot longer because it's a, a fascinating conversation and it's just going into so many areas, which is which is wonderful. Um, I mean, if we did this panel a decade ago with uh, with banking leaders, you know, phrases such as social inclusion, social justice, fairness, culture, collaboration, health and well-being and sharing would not have been mentioned. I think it just shows how, how far we have gone as a, a sector. Um, I'm afraid all good things must come to an end. One of the downsides of a virtual summit is we can't eat into the lunch break as we can when we're together in person. Although, of course, in the UK and Europe, people may have been eating their lunch while they were watching us. Uh, if so, I hope you've been enjoying it. I mean, we've covered a huge amount in just an hour with uh, managing to touch on at least COVID, climate, biodiversity, Black Lives Matters, gender, culture, uh, regulation, technology. Uh, and leadership. Um, I mean, what I come away with, and I hope our audience come away with, is a, is a greater appreciation of just how complex it is to run a bank these days. I mean, it, it was ever thus, but it's even more so now. Um, but hopefully as well, how fortunate we are to have a generation of banking leaders who, you know, first and foremost are bankers and can navigate very treacherous economic conditions that I'm sure we have ahead. But also that you're all leaders who are purposeful, committed and thoughtful human beings who understand how important it is that banks play a positive role in society to create shared and sustained prosperity for us all. So Alison, Susan, Charles, Peter, thanks for all you do for our banking profession and thank you for sharing your insights with our global community of ethical finance professionals this morning. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>